you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we continue to unravel the mysteries surrounding the five lunar auspices as the Guru are born and experience their first change in Werewolf the Apocalypse. This episode will focus on the Fjord auspice. You were born under a particular sign of the moon, as was your first change. Depending on who in the nation you ask, the moon in which you experienced your first change or were born defined your auspice. You have always felt the comfort of Luna, sister of Gaia, and valued her guidance, whether she shines fully on you or hides in darkness. The term auspice holds many meanings for the Guru. It encompasses their personality traits, attitudes, interests, and pact duties. Each auspice is significant and essential, as no werewolf can fulfill all roles. When a pack includes diverse auspices, it becomes stronger as a collective. Moreover, the inner rage of a werewolf also depends on their auspice. When young werewolves begin their training, they study with an elder of the same auspice to learn specific gifts and their roles in werewolf society. Your auspice is an obligation, not social groupings fit with stereotypes. Your ties to Luna are just as important to your loyalty to your pack and sept totem or patron. She defines your rage and reaffirms your place in the universe. It is the literal embodiment of the guru continual change in existence. Auspices are mystical and spiritual, interwoven into your psychological makeup. Your duties to her are both formal and liberating, a profession and a mindset. There is nothing in the natural world that can, can be prepared to it. Your auspice is as much as you as you are to it. Fjord's Guru of the werewolves that are born under the Crescent Moon. The Crescent Moon, a knife wound in the sky, provides a sliver of silvery radiance whilst the rest of Luna is in darkness. With this silver, the slender light of Gaia reveals her secrets to the Fjords who attempt to pierce the seemingly endless shadow of the spirit realm, the Umbra. Out of all of the Guru, they possess a strong connection to the spiritual world, serving as the seers, mystics, and sorcerers of the Guru nation, guiding the two worlds together, but not always in harmony. They are renowned for their ability to communicate with spirits, heal their fellow Guru, navigate the Umbra, and sense the imbalances in energies. They are humble advisors within their packs, respected for their wisdom and insight. The only guru with less rage than the Fjords are the Ragabash, which is fortunate since many of the spirits avoid those with high rage, which is fitting as many could be described as intuitive, mysterious, secretive, and sometimes outright deceitful. Their enigmatic ways may come across as seemingly illogical due to their adherence to the ways of the spirits. It requires a different mindset to speak and think as the spirits do, for their understanding of mortal, guru, and wolf concepts are next to non-existent. While their minds may be deeply immersed in the spirit realm and their packmates often need to ground them in reality, so keep this in mind, cub. There are many dangers in the Umbra, and remaining there for too long is dangerous not just for yourself and your pack, but the Sept and the Guru nation as a whole. For Fjords, wisdom is the most important form of renown, followed by honor. These are hard to gain quickly, so Fjords are slow to rise in rank. However, an old, wise Fjord can be invaluable to their people, even if their body weakens, unlike old Aruns, who are expected to eliminate their weaknesses, neglect or shove off said weaknesses. Alienation is a common feeling amongst Fjords, but it is one that extends to the concept of the first Fjord, which, whose tribe and identity, as well as their breed, depends on who you ask and the tribe of the storyteller, but there are always some consistent points in these many tales. The Guru is separated from the pack, tribe, and social circle. These tales, for which I have been told many throughout the years, also follow a narrative arc of five other stages or themes, the first of which is alienation. The rest are transgression, signs and omens, communication, sacrifice, and restoration. 
Transgression is the most varied, as it involves the Guru offending the spirit world. If left like this, nothing good can come from the goals of the pack and nation. The powers that can be make their displeasure known with signs and omens. Plagues, scorching summers, freezing winters, therefore just strings of bad luck, have all been common tales amongst the Guru, and I'm sure you have your own homage tales to come to mind as well. Communication comes next to settle differences, but this is often preceded with heroic dives into the Umbra, passing many trials and ordeals to just reach the spirit, demonstrating wisdom, cunning, and honor. Then, the first Guru was taught the ton of spirits. Sacrifice comes from the death of the Guru themselves, for no death was more important in their story than their own, anguished and magnified to immortalize the martyrdom. Do you believe your Jesus Christ was the first piece of fiction with this idea? At least our tale served a fucking purpose. With the balance set right again, the tragedy cease and restoration can begin. What I mean is that the Guru under the Crescent Moon are humbled to learn of the First Fierge, that their sacrifice brought us all the knowledge to speak to the spirits, to understand them so such an egregious travesty is not committed ever again, that we, that we will never know the rage of Gaia as we did then. The rite of passage for every Guru under the Crescent Moon follows a similar symbolism. Their near-death experiences unite their bodies of flesh and spirit, bridging the two worlds we inhabit together, whilst we can all sidestep and converse with spirits, the Fierges are conduits of the spirit realm. This covenant between Fierges and Luna is to ensure that the Guru never failed to pay the spirits proper dues ever again. The individual Fierge will experience the least traumatic first change, for they simply lack the rage of the Galliards and the runes, so frenzying is uncommon. A Fierge's first change is often accomplished by signs and omens and Gaian spirits, in a sense protecting the Guru, guiding them through dreamscapes that you homets may refer to as trippy. Homids may explore wilderness through instinct alone. Lupus, of course, is connected more deeply than the homid of the crescent moon to the spiritual essence of existence. Before undergoing her first change, they feel their harmony in the world, understanding their place within it and their natural ebb and flow of all things. Like the Ragabash, they typically leave their family packs at a young age. They pull the pool of the spiritual realm, a call that even most kinfolk wolves seem a oblivious to, is irresistible. Feeling misunderstood among their pack, they depart in search of someone who may understand. As they integrate into tribes and sects, Lupus Fierges are revered as supreme mystics. Rites, gifts, and spiritual diplomacy come naturally to them. While the wild-born Lupus may find solace in wilderness sects, the captive-born is equally at home in urban settings. Fierges dedicate a significant amount of time to fostering harmony with spirits, particularly in wilderness septs. Many spirits harbor deep resentment as their territories are encroached upon and the numbers of the Guru dwindle. Some view humans as the root of the problem and seek to place the blame on them. Lupus Fierges serve as a natural intermediaries between such spirits and the Guru, earning their trust and cooperation where humans might fail. The greatest peril for the Fierge Lupus is becoming excessively attached to their spiritual existence. Just as humans can be become overly fixated on the physical world, Lupus, especially Fierges, have been known to vanish into the Umbra, never to return. The Gru are uncertain whether they ascend to a higher spiritual plane or simply vanish as a distinct entity. Regardless, the loss of another Guru is tragic, and one Guru lost is one too many. It will come as no surprise to you that the Fierges are the natural right masters of the pack. They know, teach, and perform most of the rites responsible for the benefit of the pack. Fierges are not as seen as practical and rarely lead packs, though they often lead when in the Umbra or dealing with spirits. Fierges are often found in sept positions such as Call of the Wild, Keeper of the Land, and Master of the Rite. Rites, especially mystic rites, Karen rites, and seasonal rites, are their natural domain and they are inclined to learn almost any right. One could argue it is the easier fit for Krynos born, for they are the most spiritual of all the Guru, but this depends on the Karen in question, as not all treat the Krynos born equally or as progressive as our own. Some spirits loyal to the Guru extend this attitude to the litany as well. 
Within their pack, Fjerges serve as guide and sources of wisdom in the Umbra, and actors of rights, creators of talons and fetishes, and sometimes medics. In battle, they typically provide support, but remember that even the calmest of Fjerges possess the rage of the Guru. I suspect that as homage, you are all taking this rather literally, so let me explain. No, no, you are not understanding. Shut up, cup. The Fjörg's role is both varied and nuanced. They serve as clergy, priests and priestesses who hold a religious authority on preserving the mystery and the fear that surrounds the sacred spirits, though through sermons and rites, amongst other things. We are all invested in Gnosis, but it is their job to ensure that our pride never allows disrespect reminding us that the Guru and Thera are not the only things blessed by Gaia. Our spirituality provides some level of restraint to ground us. They are the truth, but a softer one of legends and prophecies, unraveling Gaia's enigmas, which is the stark contrast to the hard little truths of a philodox may have to dissect. They teach those around them to perceive and revere spirits in the same ways as they do sometimes extending to the mortals. Gnosis is shared between Guru and mortals, but the difference is that we do not believe, see, or believe all these things are alive, but we do feel the pulse of Gaia and her creations through the senses. You could argue that this is a goal of conversation or conversion, but it is making more humans perceive the damage that is being done so they can truly understand the nature things and sow the words, so the wounds, I should say, of Guru they have caused. When you pause for a moment to consider the imbalance of the world, how the weaver dominates Gaia, the difficulties the Fjordis face, and the solitary task they undergo alone, which should not be the case. Fjordis understand that whilst we can all converse with spirits, they have the greater understanding to know that they, the spirits, are not resources. This also makes them nurturers, compassionate healers, easing another's pain through reverence of Gaia. It is not always wanted, but it is often needed, as they teach us how to heal ourselves. Yes, I also mean this in a very literal sense, through spiritual healing and herbalism, but also of the corruption caused by the worm in the ways unique to this auspice, as I am sure you can imagine. Their allies in the Umbra make hoarders of secrets. Obviously, their role as messenger works the other way, making them a necromancer of sorts, which may have more political weight if the fear stops having visions of someone's ancestor's spirit, serving as a proxy to a set, which also means they are in the arm, making sure that the oaths to all spirits, to all those of the nation, are fulfilled. Ragabash and Fjordis share surprising similarities and value each other's perspectives. Ragabash inspire Fjordis with their questioning, leading to deeper spiritual explorations. Radical Fjordis find support from Ragabash, while Fjordis understand the trickster's archetype's spiritual significance and tolerate their teasing. If a Fjord feels disrespected by a Ragabash, the relationship can sour, though this is rather rare. Fjordis risk losing themselves in dogma, reciting rituals without genuine inspiration. Ragabash challenges this dogma, keeping traditions meaningful and flexible. Fjordis' responses to Ragabash's challenges range from fear and outrage to calm debate. They may even envy Ragabash's disregard of responsibilities, finding it decadent, or however that word's pronounced, especially when Fjordis must honor promises to spirits. Fjordis often depend on Philodox packmates for stability and support. Philodox helps them stay grounded and organized while receiving mystical insight in return. This friendship is mutually beneficial, as both perform rituals and ceremonies together. Galliards and Fjordis have shared responsibilities, connecting them to human society. Fjordis focus on spiritual restoration and societal influence, but may lack the social finesse of Galliards. Together, they support social activism, environmental protests, civil rights causes, and alternative alternative religious events. Galleon's stories of lone guru heroes sometimes clash with Fjord's preference for tales emphasizing piety and morality. Younger Galliards may feel frustrated when elder Fjord's act as censors, but most respect the spirits and adjust stories accordingly. Arun and Fjord's have little in common, being almost perfect opposites. Crescent moons are introspective and peaceful, while full moons are harsh and prone to anger. 
Despite their differences, Arun value level-headed Fierges as tactical assets, and Fierges rely and relay on Arun for protection in battle. They have professional respect for each other, but no strong personal ties. Friendships or rivalries between Arun and Fierges usually develop based on factors outside their duties. Most werewolves are overt threats of claws, teeth, and regenerative abilities that leave little room for subtlety. The Crescent Moons, however, go beyond this stereotype. Unlike the stealthy Ragabash, a Fjurge uses wisdom and spiritual allies to defeat enemies from afar. Fjurges are masters of the Umbra and its spirits, gathering allies like a Messiah hoarders of gold. Even young Fjurges can amass a significant number of spiritual allies. Anyone threatening a Fjurge must face not only their pack, but also their spiritual defenders, often unseen and unexpected. Defense is crucial, but the primary reason beyond a Fjurge's desire for spirit allies is an insatiable thirst for knowledge. Some Fjurges, driven by spiritual wanderlust, explore dangerous umbral realms. These Fjurges are combative and cultivate their rage, making them formidable adversaries in the spirit world. The Keepers of the Holy Mysteries is a continual and demanding role. The Worm is here to say, Cub, and someone has to look far, far into the future, and that is often the Fjurges, and with many problems in the world, and the many ways the Weaver and the Worm corrupt the land, there are many solutions, each one with its unique angle, to properly appreciate. To be kept updated, follow the Law by 9 VTM Instagram and Blue Sky pages to find out when we upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell, as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.